Hey folks, Craig Lovati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bone Zoomcast. Today is Astrodome Day on the Zoomcast. We're talking to Beth Jackson from the Astrodome Conservancy. So it's like beyond domes, maybe. Howdy folks, Craig Lavati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. I am joined by my co-host, Kat Havens. Hello, hello. And uh, today's episode is really special for me. Well, they're all really special, right, Kat? They're they are all, all special. They're all, uh, you know, labors of love. <laughs> but today is a very, very big labor of love for me. It's a very big deal. We're talking to Beth Jackson, and she is the executive director from the Astrodome Conservancy. Now, if you know anything about our show or if you know anything about me, oh God, she's wearing the Those glasses. Those are awesome. I need some holographic glasses. If you know anything about me and my history, you know that I love the Astrodome. I have the seats what? right there. I have the turf right there. There's some scribblings on my lower region of my legs He's regarding the Astrodome. He's got a tattoo, guys. There you a go. Tattoo. But one of the things that excite me so much about the conservancy is that they are looking to make the Astrodome a public place, a public forum for, you know, education, for celebrations, for, you know, anything that Houston would need it for. And to me, that is very special. And that's why we have Beth on the show today. So Beth, thank you for, uh, for logging in. Welcome Beth. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to visit with you today. So what does it for people out there who are just tuning in, what does the Astrodome Conservancy do? The Astrodome Conservancy is a private nonprofit, and our mission is twofold. Uh, we exist to make sure that the Astrodome is saved, uh, preserved is another word that we use um, for future use both to tell the story mm -hmm. uh, of the world's first dome stadium and the, the many, many uh, events and, and firsts that happen in the Astrodome, but also to work towards its viable redevelopment in the future. Um, as you said, Craig, this was the Astrodome uh, is, is uh, it's a landmark in Houston. It was Houston's living room uh, for many, many decades. And we want to see that happen again. This is an existing public owned building uh, that is in great condition and it should be reused. Just now to remind everybody, when was it built guys? Just to remind everybody, give us sort of a time scale. When was it first opened? I'm glad you asked Kat, because it really is um, interesting to talk about the Astrodome. It was opened in 1965. Right. So, you know, World War II had ended. Folks were coming back to Houston. Houston was growing mm -hmm. exponentially uh, with all the servicemen and their families uh, settling. And there's a lot about the Astrodome that represents Houston at mid-century and, in fact, represents the country at mid-century. Yep. The new materials, uh, the new engineering and technology that allowed nine acres. Yeah, that's crazy. Covered by one roof. Um, you know, it's also clearly the Astros and the Astrodome. I mean, it's associated with the race to space, which is happening right here in our backyard at mid-century. And so, you know, President Kennedy came here to, uh, to send us to the moon and the Astrodome opened a year later. So um, there are lots of, of uh, really neat parallels um, about this building. And it tells the history and the development of Houston in many ways. And it was such a big deal. My parents had just moved down here from the Northeast um, in like 63. And they, I remember, and I spent my life going to the Astrodome for this or that, but I remember them telling stories about just how absolutely incredible it was that this amazing thing was here. It was the eighth wonder, right? Eighth wonder? Eighth wonder of the world. Eighth wonder of the world. And we even, you know, they took us, you know, all the kids, all packed us all up and took us on tours and to the top of the very top seats, which made me go, but uh, <laughs> it, it was a big, it was a big deal at the time. Yeah. It absolutely was. And it has been, um, you know, it, it's been a model. The Superdome over in new Orleans, uh, is larger. We can fit the Astrodome inside the Superdome, but there wouldn't be a Superdome, but or not first. the Astrodome. The first, and frankly, there wouldn't be an NRG stadium because somebody had to have the idea yeah, to play sports inside instead of outside. 
Yeah. And not many people know either that the Oilers didn't immediately go in there. The Oilers were still at Jefferson Stadium and then played games at Rice before really? uh, they actually let uh, Bud Adams and his Oilers play inside there. So it took a while, late 60s or so, I believe, for it became because it's the, the history of the stadium is just as much the Oilers as it is the Astros too, mm-hmm. because we there was so much Oilers history that that went on there, just like the Astros. And the rodeo. The which... rodeo, especially all the concerts and everything like mm-hmm. that. But yeah, th- definitely the Astros and the Oilers, definitely they own the place for about 30 years or so. Uh, my thing about reinvigorating the dome is you also have to get younger generations excited, younger generations that don't have the memories that Kat has, or that even I have. Um, and also too, you just, you don't, you, you have to remind folks why it's so special. Mm-hmm. And, you do. and I think it's really, um, I would have thought that challenge would be much more difficult, correct? But we at the Conservancy have just finished a fairly aggressive public engagement campaign where we went out this summer uh, with an online survey and a number of events, and we invited the public, uh, Houston and Harris County residents, to weigh in on the future of the Astrodome. What do you want to see in the Astrodome? Why do you care about the Astrodome? Why should we even be having this conversation? And surprisingly to us, the number of the, the largest number of respondents were our age. They were between 25 and 44, which is on the southern end of, you know, the, the folks who actually experienced the Astrodome. And in fact, I mean, the building's been closed um, for, you know, 12 years now, going on 13 years yeah. to yeah. the public. And, and the Astros haven't played there in 20 years. Yeah. And so if a 25 year old is responding uh, to a, a building that really has not had a purpose in 20 years, uh, that tells us that there is interest in younger generations, in seeing this civic landmark um, reused and repurposed. And I, I'm not a native Houstonian either, Kat. I, okay. You know, I, your parents moved here. I moved here about a decade ago. And I will tell you, growing up, the only thing I knew about Houston was the Astrodome. The Astrodome. So for a lot of folks, and there are a lot of us that are new to Houston in the last mm-hmm. several decades, it's an identifier. Mm-hmm. It's a strong identifier for our city uh, and you know, the technology, the innovation, the race to space, the energy um, uh, sectors. It, it says a lot about this city and uh, for both for natives and for newbies. I think it's something we can all rally around. Um, well, and I, I think it's great that yeah. there's a, a group that is working specifically for that preservation because, you know, I mean, we don't tear down everything, but Houston doesn't does have a little bit of a reputation for being like out with the old in with the new. And I don't always as a historian, somebody who teaches history here, I, you know, I love seeing this pr- preserved and hopefully it stays, you know, as long as Houston stays. So, yeah. I know that there is, and I know this is probably one of the things that Beth, that your team runs up against a lot is, you know, and back in 2013 or so, we all had that vote where, you know, what there was, there was some money on the table and we wanted to see Mm -hmm. how we were going to use it. That got voted down. A lot of people see that as, well, I thought we voted against it. We, you you know, explain that to people. There's a lot of misinformation Um, as, as there is. Writ large, uh, these <laughs> days. Uh, but you're right. There, there have been some questions about the ashram. Do we still owe money on it? The answer is no. It's completely paid for. Isn't it falling down? It looks a little dingy. <laughs> Absolutely not. In fact. Uh, in 2008, during Hurricane Ike, uh, the Astrodome sustained something like a hundred thousand one, dollars. One tile, I think. They lost one tile up top, and then meanwhile, in our it was like a can opener. A <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah. seriously, it lost yeah. one tile. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, so the building's in great shape. <laughs> Sounds like uh, it. And uh, didn't we vote to tear it down? And the answer is no. The referendum, the public referendum that we voted on uh, in 2000. 13 was not an either or it wasn't go with this plan or tear it down Mm -hmm. it was simply this plan or not and the public voted not and yeah frankly we're glad they did because it wasn't a very innovative plan and it wasn't very well thought through and so now we have an opportunity we've had several opportunities (laughs) to think bigger 
and to include more people in the conversation about the future of the Astrodome. Um, an interesting fact uh, that I share often about the about tearing the Astrodome down, and these are 2010 numbers. Because the, the floor of the, the field level of the dome is 35 feet below grade, which is what part of what makes it so magnificent when you walk yeah. in and the floor drops out and the ceiling rises, uh, there are estimates between 35 and $50 million just to demolish the building it's, if the facility were ever demolished. You know, and then that doesn't even do a include lot of fifty million dollars. We can that repurpose it big time with that. That doesn't include the damages that may be done to NRG next door. Exactly. Yeah. And that's it, another and thing. Yeah. I don't think it includes filling the hole. Yeah, that's no. what I was going to say. Filling yeah. that hole would be incredible. Yeah. So I know the last time I was in there was in 2018. Um, I've always been blessed with my access that I've always been able to get in there when I needed to, yeah. especially for stories and whatnot. And it just, it really does need a really good power washing inside. Like that's the thing, but it's also old. So it's it, but a lot of people, it took people in those little public tours they would do, where you kind of basically you get a, get corralled inside and you get to walk around a little bit and then you get to go out. Cause you obviously you can't it. have people everywhere. Right. And, and um, it's, they finally got an idea of that. It, okay. It's not, you know, things aren't falling down inside or anything like that. Like it just needs some tender loving It needs care. a bath. Yeah. I'm not uh, going to throw you out because you need a bath and you're a little old, Craig. So there's, 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 there's <laughs> that aspect of that. And I think obviously too, when people got back in there and they heard the sounds, they, a lot of feelings and emotions came rushing back. And it is, you know, to your point too, Beth, like it's, it's such a story of Houston itself too, that there's so much nostalgia attached to it. You know, there's families, there's, you know, um, family milestones. There's all these different little boxes that it's checked off for people over the years. And it seems to me, and I don't know, this is just my, uh, my perception, but it's the older generations that are more apt to want to tear it down. I've noticed than the younger generations. We have a theory about that in historic yeah. preservation that, that, um, if a building that was built during your lifetime is now deemed historic and historically significant, yeah, then that means you might be historic or historically significant. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a little trite, but it Got makes it. sense. It takes time and perspective to recognize the value of something. Yeah. So, you know, me at, at, in my 40s, recognizing the impact that this building made nationally and internationally is the first of its kind, what it represented about a period that I didn't live. That's an easy connection for me to make. But, you know, it's for, funny that it's, it's, it's a no brainer. Parents who were going there the whole time. They may it's be a, like, it's right. a no brainer for people. It's crazy that it's a no brainer for transplants that can come into come to the city and go, that's your, that's your Eiffel tower. That's right. your, whatever right. you want to call it. And then for us to go like, nah, it's, nah. <laughs> and that's to me is just the, the, there's a, there's a lot of this, um, anti-transplant sentiment, but I think that's actually yeah. going to be the transplants. They're going to save most of the things in Houston that <laughs> us locals, us natives hold dear. And, uh, I, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm going off the, the deep end there with that, but I just think that it's, it's going to be people like Beth, like your, your folks, Beth, that are going to make this happen. Well, and I'm on the cusp of being like, I'm older than you guys. I'm seven years. I was born seven years after it was built and I want to see it stay. You know, and I, my whole life I spent going there from probably before I remember up until it was closed. And, you know, it is a little weird when you start thinking of buildings being historical and you're like, wait a minute. And I, and I get that, but um, I'm glad we have this younger, these younger generations because they do, in my opinion, because I work with young people are so thoughtful. Mm -hmm. I think in a way, sometimes my generation and the ones above me maybe aren't, and I'm not talking trash about my generation, but I do think they're much more thoughtful in some ways. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't, I don't meet many cause I consider myself an elderly millennial <laughs> and I don't meet many of us, especially that are local that are just like, you know, tear the sucker down. It's ugly. No. Most of us are like, it's, it's sort of, it's this, um, it's an identifier obviously, mm -hmm. as Beth said for the city, but it's also this, um, 
this really cool relic. And I mean, relic in the most positive <laughs> museum like way, it's a relic of when uh, I guess you want to say we had an imagination in this country. Yeah. You know, it was that uh, exciting time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, it's, and also too, and I know that uh, if you follow the Astrodome Conservancy uh, on any of the social pages and stuff, they're always posting these really cool, epic uh, vintage photos, which I'm sure that my buddy, Mike Acosta is the reason y'all have so many cool photos. She sent some and I was scrolling through those. Hopefully we'll put (laughs) some of those on here too. I was like, Oh my God, that is so cool. I love old photography. Yeah. It's awesome. You know, and it's, a lot of it's accessible because it is our shared history. Um, there's some great repositories around town, the yeah. Metropolitan Archives, um, uh, astrodomememories.org has a wonderful collection that anyone can access and anyone can upload to. Anyone can share their oh, cool. uh, memories and memorabilia to astrodomememories.org. Uh, but I, Craig, I want to tap into something uh, that you brought up about um about the younger generation and the, you know, the, the transplants versus the natives, we have over the five, five and a half years that the Astro and Conservancy has been um, in existence and the many, many conversations and events that, that we have held, there's not a doubt in any one of our minds that this is a beloved building, that the majority of Houstonians would like to see this building reused. Mm-hmm. The, the dissension comes around what that is and how do you pay for it? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. everything has a price tag. Yeah. And is this the best and highest use of public funds? And unfortunately, in the you know, decade that I've been in Houston, we have had some horrific major environmental disasters mm-hmm. that without question deserve the attention and the investment, um, you know, of, of our tax dollars and, and our public, um, our public money. Um, and so the conservancy wants to, and works to, um, find alternative financing mm-hmm. routes for the Astrodome. Uh, there are ideas galore in fact, former Judge Emmett and, and I know Judge Hidalgo and Commissioner Ellis get proposals left and right. Yeah. There is no lack some of- Some better, some worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no lack. I'm not going to comment on what they are, although I can hear some of my favorites. I've heard uh, some bad ones, though, you know. There's no lack of ideas. Yeah. The, the lack thus far has been funding and yeah. conservancy does not advocate for- public financing, solely public financing of the Astrodome. Um, What we can bring to the table, however, is the ability to go out and do uh, our due diligence and find funding sources, be it private, be it philanthropic, be it through federal sources that we can bring to the table, the larger Astrodome table and say, here's how to defer or how to, to, um, how to pay for a significant portion of this without it resting on the back of the taxpayers, because there are are other more pressing needs right now in our community than how do we get the lights right building? Well, Um, when you have that money too, then asking for a little bit of public buy-in is a lot easier, right? I mean, here, the bottom line is it's a public building and the public will access it. And so, yes, there's got to be some buy-in from the county. And frankly, I I think there should be from the city as well. Yeah, Uh, This is is going to be a major attraction uh, once once the facility is open again. So, yes, Mm -hmm. there has to be public skin in the game, but does it need to be to the tune of 100%? Right. No, there's, there's the other, the 50%. Other. I don't even think 50%. I think we can yeah. get that number down. Yeah. Now, another important element of keeping the dome alive, obviously, is the rodeo. The rodeo folks, they own that spot all around the dome for what, a, almost two months out of every single year. We have to make sure we engage the the rodeo, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo in that as well, because I would love to be able to have you know, if you go to the rodeo now, you have that big line. We haven't been to the rodeo in a while. It's coming back. But that big line of all the food and everything like that and all the benches and everything. 
Mm-hmm. That would be cool to have inside maybe some sort of dome stadium, you know, instead of, you know, with all the elements and stuff. So you have to, you have to also engage the rodeo as well. Absolutely. And I'm sure you guys are doing that as well. We talk to the rodeo regularly and, yeah. and what we hear from them is uh, right now, the Astrodome is a big black hole in the middle of our, yep. <laughs> yeah. our show. And so um, they recognize that there is potential there to incorporate the Astro once again. Um, the rodeo is never shy about saying, you know, the, attributing uh, the role the Astrodome played in growing the rodeo and yep. the Astrodome and attributing the rodeo to, you know, it being so well known and such a landmark uh, for Houston. And so there's a very symbiotic relationship mm-hmm. there. And I think once the uh, a plan is in place um that has the support of the rodeo um and the texans the texans have you know contractual yeah. rights to the to the area around uh the dome and so um you know again there, there's a lot of a lot of information misinformation out there about who wants it and who wants to tear it down and you know we fort- we're fortunate to be um in conversation with both the tenants and NRG Park, and everyone sees this um, as a win down the road. It just needs to be the right. There's got to be the right formula together. Like I even think back at uh, Super Bowl Fifty One that was here, and it was kind of sad to see the, do- the they they did some displays mm-hmm. on the dome's facade, but it was kind of a bummer that at that point we should have already been able to do stuff inside. Mm-hmm. You could have had exhibits or concessions or something in there. And it was like you said, for now, for any, any sort of production that comes to town, it's a black hole because you can't do anything with it just yet. You can, you know, yeah, you can, you project things on the facade and you can take a picture in front of it and take a selfie or whatever, but you can't do anything inside it. So that's the issue at hand. Cause I know that in the run up to the Super Bowl, I remember hearing little rumors and bits in here that they were like, okay, well, we want to have the Super Bowl again after this. What are you going to do about this big black hole right next to the stadium? Because <laughs> it may look cool on TV, but we need to be able to. And to your Utilize point, it. it's got to be accessible. And that's yeah. the next. That's the next. I guess stop on the journey here. And you know, accessible and and of of use. I mean, right. <laughs> there's a, there, right. There's no point pouring a lot of money and a lot of attention into this. We're not going to be able to use it. And right. There there have been over the years, a couple of schemes, um, you know, some really cool visuals about pulling the skin off and taking it down to the frame. Um, and, and I guess our comment, my comment on that, um, is we need, this space. We need this inside space. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and nothing demonstrates that more than, um, you know, the climate change report that just came out. Yeah, exactly. The storms that we've had and the rain and the weather shifts, uh, both hot and cold. Um, we need a covered conditioned Mm -hmm. space to have activities. The other, another, um, frequent answer that we got in our public engagement or public feedback, um, over the summer was we need some place to have festivals and events yep. that aren't yep. get rained out. You know, a so multi-use space great. sounds so amazing, like where it could be. And I know that's like, I'm here, I'm going to give you a proposal. I know you don't have any, no, I'm joking, but like I spent every year of my life, I'm a horseback rider going to shows there during the rodeo, you mm-hmm. know, it could be a rodeo area, then it could be an indoor festival area. Then it could be a place in case we needed maybe emergency shelter, uh, all kinds of things, right? And that's what it was designed for. So a lot of times in historic preservation, we are tasked with finding a new use mm-hmm. for a building whose use has has cycled out. Um, a lot of warehouse conversions to lofts, for example, right. using it over in Edo. Um, that doesn't have to be the case. That isn't necessarily no. the case with the Astrodome because it was built as a public forum for a multitude of uses. I mean, the Astros and and the Oilers um, are the two, and the Rodeo are the three primary tenants that we think of when we think of the Rodeo, uh, the Astrodome. But um, it it was home and host to events from A to Z in this town. And it can be just that again, but it can be 
upgraded and it can be innovative. Yeah. Just like it was in 1965. Exactly. It can make a splash again internationally when we reopen the doors to this, to our dome. When you were Uh, talking about equity, equity and access too, and as a multi purpose deal, there's opportunity for everybody of all income levels of all walks of life to be able to have access to this public space. Right. And I love, I loved how you, you know, we were talking about that pre-show and that's, I think that's, you know, seemed very important to you. It is. I I think, um, again, as, as it's baked into the mission of the Astronome Conservancy that the public um, have access to this public building, to the civic asset. And um, that was the case when the Astrodome was, was open uh, the first time around, uh, Craig, mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier, taking tours of the ashram. You could yep. go in and for a nickel, you know, take a tour of yep. the dome. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, we hear stories all the time of folks who who just walked in and looked around mm-hmm. and some of the the uh, staff were there to show them around. That's not the case now and not yeah. not the Astrodome, clearly, but not even for NRG Park. It's mm-hmm. not it's not accessible to all. You've got right. to have some cash in your pocket to get in the door most days. You've got to have tickets to whatever activities mm-hmm. happening there. Um, and that's important to the conservancy that we um, are advocating for, pushing for a facility and a, a use in the Astrodome that can be accessible to all at some point during the year. Yeah. Cause like you want to, I remember some of the stories were like having it be like a recreational area, you know, <laughs> that like, if you wanted to do your, your running, you could do it in there, but it's like, who's going to spend $25 to go run and run on a track, you know? And then also too, during the rodeo season, it wouldn't be accessible because right. the rodeo, needs that too. Right. You, you can't have interlopers, you know, going in there, you know, during any of that time, even if it's just to get you, you know, get your five miles in or whatever. Um, God bless you if you're running five miles. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I, yeah, I get, that's the, that's the, the hardest part because it's sort of like, let's get really nerdy here, Johnny. It's almost like the, um, the thing inside, uh, Tony Stark's chest. Like you can't remove that. It even looks like it too. Like you can't remove that without messing up the rest of it. Wait, was uh, that a game of Thrones reference? You no, just did? it was an Iron Man reference. We go, He's talking to how off much the could screen it? Johnny too. I am not a pop culture person. I needed Johnny to, I, I was tagging me. Johnny in. I was tagging Johnny in to the conversation, but it is like, how much could of, it cost to put neon blue lights on the dome? You know, here we go. Make it glow like Tony Stark's. <laughs> All right. I, I, I digress. There we go. But you know what I mean? It's one of those things that you, it's, it's so it's embedded in that NRG complex because I've even looked at, this was maybe 2010, 2011, that there was a, and I'm Beth, I'm sure we've seen the same stuff. There was this master plan for the NRG complex and it included the dome, but then it also on the, I believe the Southern end, they wanted to build like a hotel complex. It would be connected to NRG center because NRG center is the thing where you guys, when we go to the rodeo, that's where you go buy all your stuff. That's where you see, you know, the baby goats and everything. But they were going to build something on that southern end, closer to six ten, and it was going to include the. Du- it was a, there's always these grand plans about that whole space, but it seems that the the proverbial can gets kicked down the road each year, and that's what the conservancy is. It seems like what you guys are sort of battling too. It is, and and at its heart, this is a political conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because the building, the facility is owned by Harris County, when the leadership shifts in Harris County or changes and things starts over, you know, it, it kind of starts over. Um, That has been the case. Uh, We are very hopeful and the conservancy is not a political body. Um, As a private nonprofit, we have already brought almost a million and a half dollars just in the last five years to the process. We can go out and raise private dollars we can go out and and have partnered with the Harris County Sports and Convention Corporation. We are in conversation regularly with uh, Harris County Commissioner's Court. Um, and, and we feel like this is a, a important role and a great role for the Conservancy to kind of take it out of the political realm as as much as we can so that we can advance the project across 
elections and across mm -hmm. borders, um, you know, as, as, as that happens. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, if it were easy, it would be done. Like of I said, course. Like, there's no doubt that this city and this region love this building. There mm -hmm. are way more yes people than there are naysayers. The naysayers may be louder, it's, but we to know me, it's always been the naysayers. The naysayers are the ones who are, to me, are the older ones who don't live nearby, who are mm -hmm. sort of like, it's already down the road for them. So yeah. to them, it's just, it's, and to your point earlier, yeah, it's an old, you know, now you see it as this old, you know, retired, you know, derelict building that it gets this rap for. Instead of not. historic, instead of yeah. a historical building. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of, it, it's, it, I hate saying this, but it's almost like you, that it's such a hard road ahead to change that perception, but I don't think that it's an immovable object. I think that it, you can change perception. It's just an incredibly difficult mix. You've got a lot of feelings. Yeah. People have feelings, what they would like to see for it, or if it should remain, you have politics, you've got money, you've got like a mix that is a real challenge. Um, but what a great group of people that, you know, you've got together to try to, you know, bring that all together, but it is incredibly hard. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, we're in it for the long haul. Yeah. And um, it's neat to think about um, down the road. Yeah. Because we are, not only do we have the attention of commissioner's court and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the local media and press here in Houston and Harris County um, and our constituency. Um, but we also have some national attention mm -hmm. because nobody's figured out yet how to take a stadium and reuse it. You know, yeah. we lost the kingdom, we lost tiger stadium a few years ago. There's a, a neat project up in uh, Patterson, New Jersey uh, with an old uh, Negro baseball league stadium, Hinchcliffe stadium, but it's mm -hmm. much, much smaller in scale. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't have a lot of the same challenges. So there are cities and entities across the country that have, you know, what, what you would call aging infrastructure, like the Astrid that are wondering what are we waiting to see who's going to go first. And maybe we can be innovators again, like we yeah. were the first time with the dome being built. And then maybe again, going back to our roots of, of, of that amazing time where there was so much blossoming technology and hopefulness about, you know, science in the future. Uh, Kat, you don't need me. You're hired. Ah, you got it. Yay. You know, I found my this, way over. There's this <laughs> other aspect too. I think when it comes to, you know, um, stadiums now are not built to last mm -hmm. 60, 70 years. Disposable. Um, most stadiums now, uh, I mean, I, I would assume SoFi stadium up in, out in Los Angeles and even uh, the, the Raiders stadium in Vegas, yeah, those are billion dollar stadiums, but I don't anticipate them being there for three or four decades. They don't build them like they used to. They don't. Well, they, they build them very expensive and they mm -hmm. do. They, I've even heard people say that Minute Maid Park is old and it's 20. It's coming up on 25 years is it? and they consider that as old and mm -hmm. it, the just stadiums aren't. One of the other arguments I've always heard is that, well, if Yankee Stadium can get torn down, why not the dome? Sort of in the sense that, okay, well, you know, if that thing was is was torn down without a second thought, then yeah, this thing is of course is going to be We're torn better. Down. We're I, be want, I want us to be better at that. about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, post uh, demolition, I think there have been plenty of second thoughts yeah. about that. But I'm, yeah. I'm I'm hopeful, Craig, that um that your brethren, <laughs> millennials and, and future generations, including my kiddos coming up, um, that with the pressures from climate change and, and globalization that are coming, that, that we're going to see, and I think we're already starting to see a mind shift away from the public financing of these, um, you're right, these, these stadiums that have a 20 to 30 year lifespan. It's environmentally unsustainable. Yep. It is inequitable to use yeah. public funds and then turn around and charge 150 yeah. hours to get to come in. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that our, um, the future looks bright 
in terms of the public accountability and how we're thinking about those stadiums going forward. Again, I started that with, I have to be hopeful. I am hopeful <laughs> and I have to be hopeful. No, yeah, hope you have to. Building stadiums that have, you mm-hmm. know, two or three or four decade lifespan, and then you demolish them and do it again. Um, you know, that that's very. Well, it's cool about it. What gives me. What gives me some hope for the future is that I know up in Arlington, uh, the Rangers old stadium there, it's still there and they're just going to sort of convert it to office space. Um, and I think there's also going to be like an element, like where little league teams, younger, you know, younger players can use the field. I think they were using it for soccer for a while. So you can, you can reutilize things like that. You just have to sort of just take a leap of faith and jump out there and do it. And you know. The LA Forum is a great example, and it was a a, um, a project that used some uh, federal and and uh, uh, state tax incentives to help defer the cost away from LA County um, mm-hmm. while they reinvested in the forum. And it's a great it's a great uh, arts and entertainment venue now. Um, it's uh, you know a little smaller in scale, way smaller in scale than the Astrodome, but um, I, I think. There is innovation coming in how we think about um, building and building, you know, and repurposing and repurposing. Exactly. Yeah. The, the younger generations that I keep saying that, cause I'm just, this is always a thing for me. I'm grappling with being 50 something. <laughs> um, their, their thinking is so much different than ours or, or my generation and the, you know, the boomers, um, you know, repurposing, reusing, making the most of something, not wasting you know, I think if anyone can do it, it's that generation and Houston, right? It's such a great combination. And, um, we like to say the the greenest building is the one that's already built. Absolutely. And built to last from the energy crisis in the seventies. That was a phrase coined, uh, uh, coined 40 years ago. So I remember I was there the day it was a very, very hot, nasty, gross day when they put the plaque out front. Um, I guess no, it was on the Western side, Mm -hmm. Uh, the plaque that, you know, my buddy, Mike Acosta had written and it was like the the Texas historical marker. And I remember that time kind of going and like you guys too, probably we were all going, okay, now what? (laughs) Because we got this, but now what do we do? What's What's next? next? Yeah. And that's the, like I said, I, I wish that more people that live here can take another walk through the stadium yeah. just one once or twice just to get the feel of it. Because I remember on one of my first tours of the stadium post its use going back in, I want to say 2012, maybe it was when there was a new, and you've probably seen this too, Beth, like there's always like a renewed interest. And then all of a sudden, all the TV crews want to go in and all the reporters want to go in. And then we forget about it for a few years. And then we go back. But I remember in 2012 going in there and it was, I don't want to say it was derelict, but you could definitely tell there was not a lot of love and care going on. It was being used as still is as sort of a storage basement setting for NRG. They had rodeo tents and stuff in there. But I remember one of the most, dorkiest things that happened and i don't mean dork i mean this is it was this is what reignited me somebody dropped something in there and it was like a piece of wood or something like because they were moving stuff around and when i heard like the wood drop in there and i remembered the, the echo the, the the sound of the echo in the stadium when a ball would hit the bat i was like oh wow that's okay there we go like that was like that's that's okay let's fix this what can we do what can i do and even as a reporter i was like well there's only so much advocacy i can do Mm -hmm. without you know crossing over the barriers but i was like there we go that's the nostalgia aspect there if people can remember what it was like to actually be there for an event that's really special too so who knows maybe one day we can start you know like 3d modeling or we could start you know AI projecting like, you know, a vintage game in there. And I'm, and I'm obviously working towards oh, working for you guys That actually sounds kind now. of cool from, but <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I mean, I think, you know, we're focused on getting people back in there in person. Yep. Um, but as part of that, we've got to think internationally, you know, we've got to yep. think 
from a world perspective. Mm-hmm. This building is known around the world and people are going to want, going to want access to it. They're going right. To right. How we did this again. And, um, so yeah, I think utilizing technology and that it's way over my head, mm-hmm. um, Kat, that'll be some of your kids that you're working with. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, so, you know, yeah. they're going to be here in 20 years figuring out how, 10, 15. How to put it together. Yeah. How remember, this fit. there was the plan that there was, there was the plan that was out there. I think it was right around, maybe right before Judge Hidalgo uh, came into office. And I remember it being such a typical Houston idea was that the, the lower level was going to be brought up to city, just to street grade, right? They're going to bring up the floor to, to street level. And then under that was going to be a parking garage. Oh, and I yep. remember thinking that is the most typically Houston aspect that we're going to turn part of this icon into a parking garage. Because we, nobody in Houston wants to walk yeah. anywhere. You've got and, to drive up to the front yeah. of every place you go and have a parking space. Well, if anything, I, I remember, I remember, I remember up until a point we were like, I remember even at the, at the, at the, when I was still at the Chronicle, kind of like looking at my watch and going, okay, well, they were supposed to start doing demo for this. And then it got pushed back and pushed back. And then I think, you know, obviously we had a few floods and then we were like, okay, well, why are we spending money on this? Well, we need to spend money on this for, you know, to flood uh, mitigation, things like that. And sort of, it kind of went out the window and I'm glad we didn't just turn it into a big parking garage, Me too. but I know we still need to figure something out. And I was always even worried back when the Astros left and, you know, it had its, you know, it's, it had its, I guess it's last hurrah really was, you know, housing, you know, Katrina evacuees. And, oh, wow. and before that, I think it was, um, they used it to film, uh, Friday night lights and that was it. Oh. And that's, that was pretty much that was done for after that. And I remember kind of thinking even back then, there's no plan for this. What are we going to do? And it was sort of like, it was just kind of sat there and, nothing's happened yet. So the old joke that I like to say is that in a hundred years, it'll still look the same, you know, like NRG, <laughs> no, will be, NRG it's will have be long, better. but NRG will have long, you know, been like wiped off the map and everything. And the Astrodome will still be there. Well, because that's another thing too. Like I don't anticipate, I mean, I'm pretty sure the next time that the Texans get a new stadium and I'm sure they're going to win a new stadium eventually, it's probably not going to be there. It's probably going to be somewhere out in the outskirts of the city. You know, it's not going to be right there. So who knows? The dome may be the last thing standing in the NRG complex. It will be. (laughs) It'll be one of those things that keeps on getting passed down. You know, I think that's the fun of doing this work uh, for me is that it is a long-term um, you know, it's, it's long-term thinking. I don't with, with the growth projections in Houston, with, with, um, you know, the, some of the, the dire news coming out around the, uh, uh, environmental, um, mm-hmm. you know, implications of the next decades, uh, with, in, with industry shifting focus, we may not be a car city. Yeah. We, may tur- we may turn that Metro line at Fannin and run it straight into the dome. They yeah. We're going to move the Texan stadium downtown. I mean, I, you know, there's so much, um, We've got to remain flexible and nimble. And um, that to me is what's what is wonderful and exciting and challenging about working with historic buildings um, and especially those in the recent past, which would be the Astrodome, because the answer is not it's not going to be a one and done. The Mm -hmm. Astrodome served a very purposeful life for 40 plus years. Um, We've we've taking a break now. We've had a breather. Um, I'm not thinking about what is the next 200 years of the Astrodome. I'm thinking mm-hmm. what is the next 40 or 50 years. Right. And then we've saved the building we've, and, and saving it means giving it life, giving it a, a use. And then it's for the somebody year. else's because who knows challenge to be at that to, point, you know? somebody else's challenge to figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a really fun project. It's exciting. And um, I would just encourage you guys and, and your watch listeners and viewers um, to, you know, talk about it. Absolutely. Now I'm interested. Tell us what you want to see in there. Tell us what you want to do in the Astrodome um, and let your elected officials know, because the more those folks hear from us, uh, the more they know that, that this is in fact something loved icon Mm -hmm. and landmark in our city. And I always like to remind people too, 
that it was not a segregated building when it was open. It was for everyone. And that was one of Judge Roy Hoffines' plans for it when it was when he was even in the 50s, when he was trying to figure this thing out. It was going to be for everybody. Yeah. It was not going to be segregated. And that is, to me, one of the lasting legacies of the thing mm-hmm. is that it was for every Houstonian. It wasn't just for one group of people. It was for everybody. And it really did bring people together. And I think it can bring people together again. We we could not agree more. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it crosses um, all lines. I mean, that's why there's there's a nice... Um, relationship between you know access and equity and the Astrodome because you're right, Craig. It was it was the first Harris County building designed intentionally to be an integrated facility. Um, you know, so many firsts happened there within you know an equal rights uh, uh, globe. Uh, Billie Jean King, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, oh my gosh. Yes. yes. They're just, there's so many, uh, it is a microcosm of our development as a country and, and the different movements and phases and experiences that we've had. So. Well, uh, Beth Jackson, Beth Jackson from is the executive director of the Astrodome Conservancy. It's a nonprofit group and they are looking to make sure the Astrodome is standing. Well, I think it should be standing for another thousand years, but you know, She's only looking at 40 and 50 years. I want the thing to be, you know, you know, a thousand I, years. I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll get you 50 years down the road. And then she's got those yeah. bad shades. I want, those are, re, those are boss. I like them. They're okay. very cool. Well, those are very cool. Beth, Kat, thank you very much for indulging me for an Bye. hour or so of dome talk. And yeah, uh, yeah guys, go out there and, uh, you know, tell the Astrodome Conservancy what you, uh, what you think we should do with the dome. Please do. You can find us online at astrodomeconservancy.org. We'd love to hear from you.